to the Washington offices of a newly established division of the United States Army Air Forces, in the critical summer of 1942 came a dramatic dispatch from Cairo. Have five C-47 stand by to load special cargo. Prepare to load four B-24s with rush cargo for special project 302. Cargo for special project 302 will be delivered at airport at 1640 EWT. In this historic hurry call for munitions for a fighting ally lay the first severe test of the Army's fledgling air transport command. A call to deliver within 72 hours by air and by air alone, 25,000 rounds of armor-piercing anti-tank ammunition to General Auchinleck's men in Egypt. On that black day, Hitler's Africa Corps was but 70 miles from Alexandria, key to the Middle East, to Suez and to India. Rommel believed victory to be within his grasp. But with their ammunition supply replenished and their courage unimpaired, the gunners of the British 8th Army stopped Rommel's army in its tracks and turned the tide of the desert war. The fledgling Air Transport Command of 1942 became in time the world's greatest airline. Its bases circled the earth. Its thousands of army and civilian pilots grew as familiar with Karachi, Cairo, and Kunming as with New York, Los Angeles, or Albuquerque. Flying key military personnel and high-priority freight from continent to continent became a commonplace. Among the duties ATC took on was the rapid transportation of war supplies, drugs to save the lives of fighting men, thousands of critical items of equipment needed to keep bombers and fighters in action in distant war zones. Another of its duties was to assure a continual flow of combat planes to the fighting front. To this end, ATC's ferrying division flew hundreds of planes a week from the factories to operating bases in distant combat zones. In addition, many a combat plane was flown by its own crew over routes laid out for ATC cargo planes. Planes which would have taken months to arrive by sea have been delivered ready for battle in a matter of days or even hours. crucial period when the ferrying division was created, the saving of a few hours more than once made all the difference between victory and defeat in local actions. Within quick reach by air ferry were such distant points as Australia or China, where for months Chenault's flying tigers stood alone as a token of America's promised aid. Building up the organization needed for operations on so vast a scale was a job of pioneering. Principles and techniques perfected by civil airlines in their relatively limited fields had to be adapted to the infinitely greater requirements of global flying. But a smooth operating routine was quickly achieved by ATC's personnel. Pilots and crews learned to conform to the many procedures which ensure security and efficiency. To meet any conditions of weather or terrain, and to provide for changes of destination, special equipment was made available at the airports of embarkation. In 
In regular conferences, pilots and navigators were thoroughly briefed on the flight conditions they would encounter on their next hop. Radio operators were informed of any local regulations of radio control, which they must observe. When at least two hours out from any station at your destination, you are to call this station and send your estimated time of arrival message. In this message, you will contain the call sign, the type, and serial number of your aircraft. Also, you are to request the weather for this particular field. Pilots and navigators could check and recheck on detailed charts the course which they would fly. Ever increasing at the airports of ATC has been the number of cargo planes arriving and departing each day. For the monthly tonnage handled by ATC, the exact figures of which have been a closely guarded military secret, reached totals which before World War II would have seemed incredible. On the distant and difficult land fronts of the South Pacific, cargo planes have proved their effectiveness in moving in on short notice and in ever-increasing quantities, arms and equipment which have figured as decisive factors in the campaign. In island warfare, where surprise attacks have won for the United Nations forces strategic advantages of tremendous importance, the speed of reinforcement, which air supply alone could give, has proved to be a trump card against the Japanese. One of the ATC's busiest routes, after the opening of the Mediterranean theater of war, was that across the South Atlantic, from Brazil to Africa. Since 1942, ATC planes have flown supplies across ocean and jungle to deposit them at otherwise inaccessible points far removed from ports or railheads. At villages deep in the heart of Africa, intermediate bases have been set up and equipped as way stations on the African supply route. At each base, the routines of ATC have been carefully followed. Arrivals and departures have been checked to schedules in the battle to keep abreast of the Army's stiff program of air deliveries. Planes have been serviced and refueled by ground crews familiar with all types of aircraft using the route. In case of emergency, spare parts have always been on hand. Any information airmen may have picked up en route has been carefully recorded and collated for the benefit of following flights. Bob, did you have any trouble at all with your navigation? The only trouble we had was with the natives. What was that? Oh, if you go out your airplane at night, they'll take a shot at you. Since 1942, there has been no military Shangri-La to which the ATC has not flown, even if two continents or three had to be crossed by air. Thus, in the work of America's Air Transport Command, modern technical genius has proved how the airways of war can become airways of peace, how aviation can bring to the remote corners of the world a new conception of the world itself. Already in lands long considered backward, native workers have learned to perform tasks which are shaping their habits and their aspirations for the future. Today, their airport jobs are those of routine maintenance. Tomorrow, they may be technicians and pilots, perhaps partners in the adventurous world to follow victory and peace. 
Thus, the U.S. public's interest in the world of air has grown and broadened as the scope and accomplishments of wartime aviation have become better known. And with total victory in sight, the miracle of the global airways, which will unite and serve the world of the future, has become, if not a fact, then a promise by no means remote. What benefits or problems the air transport of the future may bring still remain to be determined by the wisdom of the people in the post-war world and the skill of their statesmen. But in the space of a few wartime years, America and her allies have demonstrated beyond doubt that the material and technical problem of establishing and maintaining global airways can be solved, and that no physical obstacle can long remain to block man's inevitable conquest of the world of air. <laughs>